And so from there I started carving it down. Nobody would do it. I was sending it out to people. Sent it to Urjo. Urjo hated it. Everything, you know, as I said, everything that I liked about it, he hated about it, which I took as a good sign. And I think I sent him a letter back saying, Urjo, thank you for your notes, but fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> I think I may have done that. I, I'm not the only one who did that with Urjo, however. <laughs> I'm sure. And uh, the, the Playwrights, Colony, the Playwrights um, Festival started at Alberta Theatre Projects in Calgary a couple years earlier while I was working on this, and I'd gone down the previous year and saw uh, some of the shows that were going on. I went, this is very exciting. There's nothing like this going on in Edmonton. I know. I'll move to Calgary. So quit my job, dumped my apartment, um, took a friend who last minute, she'd, she'd been married for three months. She said, I hate being married. Can I come to Calgary with you? I said, yeah, let's go. She left her husband. <coughs> I left everything behind and we moved to Calgary. <clears throat> and uh, I went over to ATP and introduced myself. No, I didn't actually introduce myself. I was working as a waiter at Chianti and a whole table of ATP people came in, including Michael Dobbin, okay. who was running the place at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting on them and he said, oh, you know, our waiter isn't just a waiter. He's actually a talented young playwright named Brad Fraser. And I said, great, do my fucking show. <laughs> <coughs> and gave him a copy of Remains. Mm -hmm. And they were terrified of it. And uh, the year of the Olympics, which was 88, which was a, an amazing year, and I was living in, uh, in Calgary, there was this huge arts festival going on. I had won a uh, competition to write for CBC Radio every day of the Olympics, these, sketch, these comedy sketches every morning that I did with actually the guy who was my boyfriend at the time, whom I was falling in love with. So it was this really magical kind of fireworks and everything mm -hmm. sort of period. And they did a reading of Remains in the Lobby as part of the festival that year. And it was Bob White who had come in as a dramaturge who convinced Dobbin to do it. And people loved it. I mean, it just went like crazy. And so they scheduled it for the next year after a lot of soul searching. Uh, so they were going to do it the next year. And there was a lot of uh, uncertainty and controversy. But it, everyone was committed. And I rewrote the play and kept polishing it up. And they hired the actors. There was someone who was brought in to direct it, uh, someone that Dobbin insisted direct it because uh, he felt that this director's touch would soften what I was doing. And as it turned out, that director really wasn't the person to be directing the show. And the actors all hated that director and were behaving very, very badly and were calling me up at night and saying, you know, we're not getting what we need. What do we do? What are we supposed to do? And I finally got really fed up with it and went into one rehearsal. And this was in the days where, I mean, the whole AIDS thing was going on. And I, convinced, I was convinced that I was HIV positive and was dying. They had, they, you know, we'd only just had a test for a couple of years at this point. I'd been out and doing everything you can possibly do. So by, by about the time um, 88, 89 roll around, I sort of convinced myself that I'm going to die of AIDS and I don't really care what anybody else thinks. I've, I'm on a mission here. So I went into rehearsal and I said, okay, everybody stop, stop. Now you people, you've been phoning me every night. <laughs> you're behaving very badly. Director, you're not doing your job. Let's talk about it and let's get this going. And every one of those actors said, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? And I had my current partner, an ex-partner, and another ex-partner in the show. And every one of them sold me up the river. And I was like, yeah, OK, I'm just going to step out of here. You guys deserve whatever happens to you. I left them alone for a few days, and it all blew up. Right. It all blew up, and the director ended up quitting. And uh, Bob White kind of stepped in, and I kind of took over in the giving of notes and everything, which I'd been doing anyway. And we, and we were opening the show and every, the whole theater is like totally freaked out. We've got this gay show with serial killers and nudity and lesbians and underage bus boys and all kinds of stuff happening in it. And uh, in the previews, Dobbin actually came out, well, through the whole run, he came out and offered to give people their money back if they wanted to leave the show now before it started. And he was quite serious. Who's going to do that? What kind of, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better, a better selling tool, right? So everybody stayed in the first preview we had, which was also an AIDS fundraiser, a fundraiser for AIDS Calgary, and had a very queer and queer-friendly audience. The play started, and from the moment David walked in and said, honey, I'm homo, which is his first line in the play, it was like this roller coaster ride that just started building. All these people were seeing themselves represented on the stage in a way they had never seen themselves and it was funny, and it was touching, and it was scary, and it was like this roller coaster of laughter where at the end of Act One, I mean, I w it was like I'd taken the best drug in the world because there was so much laughter and applause at the end of the act, right? It was, was still, to this day, one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had in the theater. Reviews, however, 
were not very friendly. I mean, uh, the, the Calgary reviewer liked it, but the Globe and Mail reviewer uh, called it like a gay fantasy or something. Peter Zosky, I was on there promoting it, and he said, well, what about this guy who says it's a, a gay fantasy? And I said, well, I'm gay, it's my fantasy, he's probably right. <laughs> you know, but it, again, it sold out like crazy, and I had no idea because I wasn't actually going to the theater all that much. I think I was working on something else at the time. And then on a closing show, I went to go and see it, and as we walked up to the theater, I went, why, is, why are all those people standing outside the theater? What's going on? And I realized it was a lineup for tickets, and there weren't any available. And I was walking past, and all these people were going, Brad, Brad, give me a ticket, Brad, I can't get in, Brad, Brad. And I was like, I don't, these people know who I am. This is the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. And that day, my life changed. Like, it literally, I mean, in profound ways and in, you know, subtle ways, but all of a sudden it was like you have a hit play that now people in New York want to do, that people in Toronto want to do, that people in London want to do. I mean, that was a really amazing moment, and even more so because so many people in Canada had not wanted to do the show, and I, I heard so many rude things from artistic directors about how it had no love and it had no hope, and this whole kind of, that bullshit they do where they superimpose their own issues over the audience so they can get away from, with not programming stuff that makes them slightly uncomfortable, right? So after putting up with you know, years and years of that stuff, it was really gratifying to finally have you know, a kind of unqualified hit with the box office, even if it wasn't with the critics. Did you, looking at that line, did you feel inside just this voice go, yes, I knew it? Yeah. 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 I you, absolutely did. Mm -hmm. I, said, I knew I could do this. I mm -hmm. knew I could be this. I knew I deserved this. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is exactly how it should be. This mm -hmm. is exactly how it should be. 